bit, I'm going to show images and talk about red cleft cysts. Red cleft cysts are non-neoplastic, epithelial-lined cysts, where the content of the cyst is formed by the epithelium, and they are pretty common and found in about 1 in 5 routine autopsies. Radcus cleft cysts occur in the cellar and supracellar region. They typically range in size between a few millimeters to a little bit more than a centimeter, but they can be even larger. These are sagittal T2-weighted images of a 13-year-old girl, where you can see a radcus cleft cyst located between the anterior and posterior pituitary with low signal on the T1-weighted images. Radcus cleft cysts are congenital, so I'm going to repeat a little bit of the embryology that I already talked about in the brain bit by bit on the posterior pituitary. And I'm going to start very early in embryology, in week 4, Carnegie stage 12 and 13. And to put things in perspective, in week 4, there's the formation and the beginning of Radcus pouch, whereas the pantine flexure appears in week 5. And the events we talked about in the embryology of the posterior fossa happens in week 6, 7 and 8. And the perforation of Blake's pouch cyst occurs in week 9 and 10. So the formation of Radke's pouch is very early in the embryology. And in this early embryo, you can see that I have outlined the forebrain in yellow and the pink thing, the pink lines here are representing the foregut and the foregut is an endodermal lined tube and the opening of the foregut is covered by ectoderm and that's going to be the mouth and it's called in embryology this location the stomodeum. The stomodeum perforates in human embryos at day 22, so early in week 4, and this leads to two layers of ectoderm coming together. This is an histologic specimen, you can see the neuroectoderm again, and then there's the ectoderm of the stomodeum and what's going to become the mouth and these two layers of ectoderm interact and this interaction leads to the induction of Radke's pouch so there's upward movement and invagination of this ectoderm where in the neuroectoderm there's posterior downward movement of the infundibular process. The Radcus pouch constricts at the end. This is the craniopharyngeal canal. And then you have Radcus cyst, which anterior end thickens and forms the anterior pituitary. And Radcus cleft is located posterior of the anterior pituitary and lined with the epithelium from the ectoderm from the oral cavity. And if the fluid is more than just a cleft, you have a radcus cleft cyst. The signal intensity of radcus cleft cyst depends on the cyst content. The epithelium can form very watery CSF-like fluid and then it's high on T2, low on T1. But sometimes the fluid resembles motor oil and is much thicker and proteinaceous and then it has high T1 signal. So Radcus cleft cysts can have every signal intensity. 
The symptoms of a retcus cleft cyst depend on the location. Retcus cleft cysts can be located cellar, supracellar, or along the pituitary stalk. Most retcus cleft cysts are asymptomatic, and there was an article in Neurosurgery in 2022 where they looked at 20, 229 patients with a mean age of 43, and they suggested that if you have an asymptomatic retcus cleft cyst, a five-year follow-up to exclude growth might be useful. In the top differential diagnosis of a retcus cleft cyst is a, a cystic adenoma. And I've already shown this flowchart before. And an intracystic nodule is very indicative of a retcus cleft cyst. And this intracystic nodule is probably some epithelium that has been shed off, so it's debris and it should not enhance. If you have an enhancing lesion in your pituitary region, you can think of a craniopharyngioma, which some authors consider a continuum with retcus cleft cyst. And we're going to talk about that in the next brain bit by bit. Thanks.